welcome to the Michigan Man Podcast on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew for Wolverine fans from coast to coast. Go Blue and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Juwan Howard and his team are struggling over the last month, especially on the road, but so is everyone else in the Big Ten. Joining us on our game day segment this week will be beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. But first, let's get it started with a few of my thoughts. The football hot stove season is in full swing now. With LSU impressively beating Clemson in the national championship game, the season is officially over. The big news this week on the Michigan football scene was Chris Partridge leaving to take the D.C. job at Ole Miss with Lane Kiffin. Now, he deserves that opportunity, and we should all wish him well, but he leaves a huge hole on the Michigan staff. We should find out soon who Jim will hire to replace him, and most agree we need a top-notch coach who is also a great recruiter. This is a very important hire, to say the least. I'm trying to keep the focus on basketball for most of the programs this winter, but as always, we will spend time talking football. In the next few weeks, we'll get Steve Lorenz back on the show with his thoughts on what's happening in Michigan football and the always crazy recruiting world. Juwan Howard's team has come back down to earth after a hot start. Sure, not having Isaiah Livers hurts, but the defense has struggled, and the offense has been good, but not good enough recently. I still think we're an NCAA tournament team, but we have to pull it together and get back on track very soon, and that will not be easy. My guest today still thinks Michigan has the pieces to make the big dance. Joining us next is beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News on this week's Michigan Man, in partnership with our friends at SB Nation's Maize and Brew. So stay with us. Here with us on our game day segment this week as we talk a little Michigan hoops uh, to get things going is beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. James, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me back, Mike. Well, on Sunday we saw Michigan uh, struggle up in Minneapolis uh, against Minnesota. Uh, once again, we had trouble with the, the post defense, uh, stopping Daniel Orturo. He had a career day. I know fans are going to say, hey, it w- it's all on John Teske, these struggles lately, but it's more complicated than that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a multitude of things. Um, it is. I mean, John is struggling. Um, I mean, he's kind of he's been put on an island, you know, guarding these guys one on one. And I think if you just think back to what Michigan did well last season, I mean, Michigan did a good job of of taking away the three point shot and making teams uh, take tough two point shots. And I mean, the strategy with Jawan Howard is he wants to eliminate the three point shot, which they have they have done a good job of. I mean, if you look at the stats, I mean, they have given up the fewest three point shots uh, by a wide margin so far um, in the Big Ten. But the problem is just that. What John Teske did so well last season was, if you look at how Michigan defended teams, he did a good job at like hard hedging ball screens and you know kind of preventing guards from getting down into the lane. And he did a good job recovering, you know, back to his guy in the paint. And then when when guards or perimeter players did penetrate the paint and kind of get to lane, he did a good job of rotating over and contesting shots and you know walling up and making things uh, tougher on the rim. But I mean, it, they're just not playing that way this this season under Jawan Howard. So everything's basically one on one, and so that means. You know, with Daniel Oturu against Min- on Minnesota this uh, this past weekend, you saw there were several times where Oturu would get the ball out on the you know out at the three point line, and Teske would have to go out there to defend him because you know like how Javon Howard wants him, they want him to play one on one, and uh, you know Oturu just had a quick first step, and there were several times where he got it and he just put it right on the floor and and just drove right to the rim. I think they're just asking you know Teske is like I said he just he's not used to defending this way, and I think it's just stretching him out more and. You know, last season he was just better, you know, when he was just kind of staying around the rim, or like I said, when he was hard hedging ball screen. So, and a lot of it too is, I mean, Teske's not the only person who's struggling one on one. I mean, a lot of other guys are as well. I mean, look at Marcus Carr kind of killed Michigan in the, in the second half too, just con- consistently getting into the lane and uh, scoring around the rim or creating for other guys. And yeah, it is a multitude of things. And the one thing is that you just, you think Juwan Howard is going to have to to do something to, to change this, this defense because. The one thing John Beeline always did was he always, you know, adapted and changed things to his team's strengths. And, I mean, if you look at what they're trying to do with this defensive strategy, I mean, you could say it's half working. I mean, they are, you know, doing a good job of defending the three and taking it away, but they're also giving away, they're also giving up way too many easy layups and baskets around the paint. And I think 
once you start to do that, I think it, it helps simplify game plans for other teams. I mean, Daniel Oturu and Marcus Carr after the game admitted, they're like, yeah, we know Michigan's not going to double in the post, so they're just going to continue to – they just fed Daniel Oturu, and that's all they did. And I mean, you saw against Purdue, that's what the Boilermakers did with Travion Williams, and that's the same thing that Painter said. He's like, if they're going to play him one-on-one, I'm just going to continue to give it to him. The same thing Graham McCaffrey said when uh, Michigan defended Luba Garza one-on-one, and we saw how that ended up. So I think this is one of those things, I mean – Juwan Howard's going to have to go back to the drawing board and maybe tweak some things. Because, I mean, it's it's one of those things. It's like insanity. I mean, it's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And so far through these five Big Ten games, I mean, Michigan's defense ranks last in, you know, field goal percentage defense. They rank last in scoring defense. So uh, clearly something's not working. And uh, so we'll just see kind of how, you know, what adjustments Juwan Howard needs to make. And I think obviously just given the way, you know, Big Ten men have kind of went off every single game against Michigan. The first thing would be to maybe not have to double every single time a big touches it, but you got to start to throw, you know, a variety of looks, have a guy dig down or flash down, maybe make the big man pick up his dribble soon. Because, yeah, I think they're just allowing guys to just get into a rhythm and get comfortable way too early in games. And, and we've seen how that's been playing out so far. Oh, yeah, we have. And, you know, I, we know it's not a lack of effort. And uh, we have different personnel on the floor uh, this year as opposed to last year. But when I was watching the game on Sunday, I was thinking, you know what? It, it really makes you appreciate what a great defender uh, Charles Matthews was because he changed what the other team was doing on the floor too, didn't he? Oh, for sure. I think that's the biggest thing. I know Luke Yaklich, um, he was the de facto defensive coordinator last season and and he did a good job, you know, at the at the helm of you know Michigan's defense the two seasons he was here. But yeah, I mean Charles Matthews was uh, he was a huge part of what Michigan was able to do defensively and, and the success they had. I mean he was really a, a lockdown guy. I mean just because of his his length and, and athleticism was just just gave people fits. I mean you think back to last season what he was able to do. I mean he was guarding you know teams point guards at certain points. He was you know guarding their top perimeter player. Um, and I mean, Michigan just really doesn't have that guy on the roster, just like a like a lockdown, shut down perimeter guy. I mean, Franz Wagner has good defensive instincts, and I mean, he could eventually be that that type of player. But I mean, he's I mean, he is a freshman, and he's he's not quite to that level yet. So I think yeah, that's just that was a huge key to Michigan's uh, success on defense the last two seasons was having a guy like Charles who could switch any screen and just guard you know one through four you know seamlessly and just make everything everything tough no matter who he defended and yeah Michigan just doesn't have a guy like that on the roster and, and you're kind of seeing that you know play out this season. Well I'm not trying to uh, to make excuses for the defense I don't think anyone is but we have played arguably the toughest schedule in the Big Ten so far and you know when you look around it seems like we know the trend in college basketball has moved away from post play you know big men down low. Big Ten though is a different story and we have an abundance of big talented post players in the conference, don't we? Yeah, I think this is my fourth year on the beat, and I think this is by far um, the year where they have the best talent um, at, at the big man spot. Like, you just look at every team. I think if you look at every roster, you can. there's a big name, you know, as a, as a big man. I think the only two teams you can maybe say there isn't really a big name is maybe Nebraska and Northwestern, and those are, you know, two of the, you know, the teams that, towards the bottom of the standings in the Big Ten, but... I mean, yeah, and you and you think about it too, like who who the teams that Michigan still hasn't even faced. I mean, they still have to face Penn State, who has like Mike, Mike Watson, Mike Watkins, and Lamar Stevens, and they still got two games against Ohio State, who maybe has one of the best big men too, and Caleb Wesson. You know, this Friday they they face Luca Garza again, who's playing like an All American, and he's like you know leading the Big Ten in scoring, and he's just been a double double machine. Uh, yeah, it's just it is kind of insane. Just every every single game. You, there's just yeah it's just like it seems like it's just a stud big man that Michigan is going up against and I mean that's the one thing too is with with the whole defensive strategy against post play it's just I mean I get like maybe in years past that could work just because I mean maybe every team didn't have a you know really standout big man but I mean yeah this year in the Big Ten it's just every single team um you can just go through like I said it's like 12 of the 14 teams you look at the rosters and it's just Every guy just has like a, a standout big man, and that's the one reason why I think. Man, I mean, Michigan's just got to rethink its its strategy because, I mean, so far they faced you know five five different big men, and so far you know five different big men have, have really kind of given Michigan fits so far this season. No, absolutely, and I'm sure Jawan is uh, looking at you know some doing something, changing something up. But Daniel Arturo, uh, I'm not going to be too too hard on John Teske on Sunday about that. Yeah, he could have played better. 
But that guy is, he's different. I mean, he can take you outside. He can hit from three-point land. He can put it on the uh, on the floor and beat you dribble drive. He is a very, very multi-dimensional uh, offensive threat. Yeah, he showed, he showed a little bit of all that, yes, um, on Sunday. And I think he was, I mean, you look at how the scoring went from Minnesota. I mean, he, none of their guards even made a three before. I mean, he made the first three-point shot um, for their team on, on Sunday. And, I mean, it was just insane what he was able to do throughout that entire first half. I mean, he single-handedly, like, carried, you know, the Gophers through that first half. I think he had 20 points in, on, like, 9 and 12 shooting. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he was single-handedly just carrying that team. And, he, like I said, I mean, he was he gets the ball out on the three-point line. He can, you know, he had a, he had a quick first step. He was able to just to get right by um, John Teske, kind of get to the rim. And the one thing he kept doing is he had a really impressive spin move. He would just, you know – yeah. Get guys on his hip and then just spin, whoop, lose the guy, and then, you know, just go up with his left or his right and just finish right at the rim. And, I mean, he was, you know, battling on the boards, getting, you know, putbacks. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was doing a little bit of everything. And one of the most Im- impressive things for me is you think of, of big men and you don't think about, you know, the minutes they can play. I mean, I think he was averaging over 37 minutes or something a game, which is almost unheard of when you think of, you know, big men and just, you just think of the physicality of, you know, the Big Ten play and guys just, you know, banging in, in the post. And, I mean, on Sunday he still played almost 35 minutes. And, I mean, you got to – and that includes, uh, you know, the three or four minutes stint where he kind of left the game when he kind of had that hard fall and he said his shoulder kind of slipped in and out a little bit. That's that's just crazy in itself <laughs> that he was able to, to come back from that. And then even after suffering a scary fall like that, he came in and Michigan just had no answer for him. And he was – and you look at how the – the game, like you look at those, the final six minutes, you look at the final three minutes of the first half and the final uh, three minutes of the game in the second half. And I mean, he was the guy that kind of sparked those late runs that they had. Um, I mean, they closed the first half an 11 1 run, and he had a, a few baskets down the stretch there that kind of helped them, you know, turn a 10 point deficit into a one point deficit and really change the momentum of the game. And then, you know, late in the second half, it was when, you know, Eli Brooks hit that big three to kind of give Michigan that, that one point lead late in the game. And then, who was it that came right came right back and answered? It was Oturu. I mean, mm-hmm. he came right down and spin move layup, and then that kind of sparked that late run for them and kind of helped them put the game away. Well, we're focusing a lot on uh, the the problems with the uh, the post defense, but Minnesota, as you mentioned a few minutes ago, was getting into the paint almost at will on Sunday with dribble drive penetration. I mean, even Xavier Simpson was was getting beat and struggling. And I was thinking as I was watching this week, is the fact that he's needs to do more on offense this year for this team maybe affecting his defensive performance some um maybe i mean i'm not sure i think he's still playing a, a lot of minutes i mean him and him and marcus Carr. i mean they both didn't sit at all i mean they all they both played all all 40 minutes um so either might be i mean he might be exerting more you know um energy on the defense then but i mean i don't i mean if we were to ask Xavier Simpson that i don't think he'd use that as an excuse just because i think he's He's been logging these heavy minutes. You know, I mean, he's used to he, he logged heavy minutes all last season, so I don't know if that's really been in effect. But I mean, yeah, I mean, he he had he has had some struggles, but I mean, it is. I think it just goes goes back to kind of just this uh, the defensive strategy. I think every guy would just say that they need to play better one on one. And I think you know, last season, I mean, you know, Xavier Simpson is still a, a very good you know on ball defender, but I think it's just a lot of times he's. These guys have just been kind of put in in tough situations, and I mean Xavier's just kind of kind of one of those guys. But I mean, I don't know if him trying to take on more of a scoring role really really affected his defense. But but yeah, I mean he has had to try to step up. I mean just with Isaiah Livers being out, um, someone's kind of going to have to kind of step up and and take on more of a role. And I think he had, he admitted that before the the Purdue game that I mean he is looking to try to score more just because I mean it's no one no one single handedly is going to replace you know, Isaiah Livers' production and the 14 points he was averaging. So you're going to kind of need a multitude of guys to step up. And I just think Xavier's just been one of those guys these last four games who's just been trying to, I guess, take on more of a, a larger role on offense just to kind of help make up for that lost production that they have with uh, Livers off the floor. And, you know, on offense Sunday, I thought we moved the ball really well. We're getting good open looks all day. They just weren't going down. So the, the, the shooting woes on the road continue though, don't they? From the outside, the perimeter game. Yeah. I mean, they still, they still made enough threes. I mean, you look at, they made 10 threes and you think of what it takes to maybe win a road game. I mean, usually you make 10 threes in a game. You have a pretty good shot of, of, of stealing a win there. And, and I mean, they did, they started off, off hot from the, 
from the game and from three point, I think they made maybe six of their first nine three point attempts or, or something like that. I mean, they made their first four attempts of the game, and then it, they had like a rough stretch. I think they mm-hmm. missed, they missed like um, I think they only made like five of their last fourteen attempts or, or something like that. That maybe skewed the numbers and made it seem like it was a, a rough game. I mean, they got off to a good start, and I mean, at the end of the day, you look at the stats; they they made enough to steal a road game. But yeah, I mean, there were there were several open looks. The ones that kind of stand out is in that first half when they were kind of building that lead, there was, there was a couple corner attempts that Eli Brooks had that were wide open and, and he missed. And yeah, that was kind of the theme looking back to some of the other road games they had at Illinois and that state, they had open looks. I think Michigan state though, I think that was more of a hesitancy. I think they had open looks and then they just kind of passed them up or they were just took a split, split second too long to shoot shots. Um, Illinois, I think it was, it was a fact. Yeah. They just didn't get shots to fall. I mean, I think they were, they weren't trigger shy in that game. I think they, they were taking an open look, and they just can get nothing to drop. But yeah, Minnesota was kind of the same way. Like they don't know game, they had open looks, and they just couldn't get couldn't get them to drop. And like I said, I think the two that really stand out were the, the two in the corner that Eli had, where when they were building that lead, they really could have really built that margin and kind of widened the gap. Um, and the one thing that really didn't kind of make sense with uh, the rotation that Michigan had was David Julius came in early and he knocked down two threes when they were building that lead, and then. He sat, and Adrian Nunez came in, and I really didn't understand that after David was kind of playing well, and they put an Adrian in for a few minutes, which um, kind of really didn't make much sense, given that David was playing well, and he knocked down two threes early. But, but yeah, I mean, I think they kind of shook off their woes a little bit, but, yeah, they had that rough stretch um, after they kind of got off to the hard start where they just couldn't get shots to drop. But, I mean, end of the day, you make 10 threes on the road. I mean, you have a pretty good pretty good chance of kind of stealing a win in. And, I mean, at the end of the day, Michigan did. I mean, they had the lead with, you know, under three minutes to go, but they kind of just fell apart in those final three minutes. You know, as far as outside shooting goes and offense, uh, in general, I, I keep waiting for Franz Wagner to, uh, you know, to uh, catch fire, and that's asking a lot for a freshman. But overall, I mean, he, he got sort of a late start with the injury, granted. But what do you think of his play so far? It's been a little bit up and down. I mean, he's had some big games. I think his best game so far was the uh, the overtime game against Oregon. I think he scored over 20 in that game. I think that's been his probably his best game so far this season. And I mean, he had a, it seems like he's had like quiet games. I don't know if he's really had that, that breakout game where he's really kind of just like wild people. I mean, it's kind of like you look at the Purdue game. I mean, he scored 15, but it was kind of like a quiet 15. And then, then against Minnesota, I mean, he scored 17. So I mean, he was setting a team and scoring there, but yeah, just, I, I think you're just, I think a lot of people are just kind of waiting for him to kind of just have that, make that big splash of that big game where he really just kind of takes over on offense and, and he really hasn't had that yet. But, I mean, yeah, it is tough. I mean, he kind of, as we all know, he missed the first four games um, with that fractured right wrist. And, I mean, yeah, he kind of had to get into game shape and kind of get his rhythm, you know, kind of on the fly here during the season. I, and I think you're, you're starting to see that. I think his, his three point, he's starting to make threes. He kind of got off to like a slow, slow start from three-point range because, um, as we know, that was kind of his label kind of coming into the – into the season, you know, mm-hmm. from when he played Alba Berlin, he was known as like a perimeter guy and a, and a three-point threat, and he kind of got off to like a slow start from three-point range uh, early on. But, I mean, you look back, I mean, it, against Purdue, I mean, he made three outside shots, and, you know, I mean, against uh, uh, Minnesota, he was the only guy to make uh, – him and uh, David were the only guys to make more than, uh, than one three. I mean, he made four in that game. So, I mean, I think he's kind of starting to get um, back into shape. And, and the weird thing is, too, with like his – you know, it being his right wrist that got injured, you wonder if it was, like, affecting his shooting form and anything like that. And he, he said it isn't. But, I mean, if you just look at these past few games, it seems like he's maybe starting to get more comfortable, get more in a rhythm. Like I said, he's kind of made multiple threes in these last few games. So, hopefully that's a, a sign that there's uh, more things to come. But, yeah, I think with him it's just, uh, like I said, it just seems like he's never had, like, a big, big game. I mean, you look at the Oregon game, he kind of he made big shots. He kind of took over in one stretch there early in the second half and uh and in overtime too he hit that big three point shot that kinda gave Michigan the lead. But aside from that, I don't know if like you can really look at any moments so far in these games where you think like, oh man, he really took over during a stretch and I think that's kind of the one thing um people are waiting for. But another thing is too is that with Isaiah out, um Isaiah was getting a lot of attention on defense and you kinda wonder what uh opponents who they're keying in on on, on offense and um Maybe Franz is that guy. Maybe teams are focusing a little bit more on. Maybe it's Eli Brooks. You kind of don't know what defensive game plans are. So, but yeah, I think I think a lot of people are still just waiting for maybe him to kind of have that one big breakout game and maybe that 
or maybe that one dominant stretch where he really just kind of takes over a game. Um, that hasn't happened yet, but Jawan Howard, as we know, I mean, it was what, like maybe five games into Franz's career, and he already said he could be one of the best players to wear a Michigan, Michigan jersey. So that's uh, plenty high praise. I think uh, we're all just kind of waiting to see what maybe the Wolverines are have been seeing in practice and maybe just see Franz kind of have this, this big uh, breakout moment. Here at the Center Game Day segment this week, Talking Michigan Hoops is beat writer James Hawkins from the uh, Detroit News. You know, James, uh, a lot of fans I hear from say, don't worry, we're struggling now, we'll get better when Isaiah Livers comes back. Can he really be that kind of the difference maker? I think when you look at this, I think he you could make a, a case that he is Michigan's best player just based on what he can do. I mean, he's just so versatile on both ends of the floor. I mean, he, he can guard, you know, every position on defense, you know, one through five. And then, I mean, on offense, I mean, he just is their their best uh, outside shooter, their best perimeter threat. And, I mean, the, the, the things he can do to impact the game that maybe just doesn't show up on the, on the stat sheet is just, I mean, the, the threat he poses on offense. I mean, teams, you know, he, he's more of a focal point um, this season as, as he was, you know, opposed to last season, obviously when he was, you know, more of just a, a six man or, and played a, you know, a smaller role. But I mean, kind of as a, you know, as a, as a key guy this season, I think, you know, a, a defenses, a po- opponents were maybe keying in on him more. And that was, and that was um, just the threat of that alone was um, allowing, you know, teammates to get open shots and he was maybe opening things up for other guys just because uh, opponents were, you know, maybe giving him more defensive attention than other guys. So, there is a lot that he can, that he brings and that he provides. Um, and yeah, it's just cause he's just uh, such a versatile piece. Like I said, he can defend out on the perimeter, defend in the paint. He can switch anything. He can effectively guard any, anybody on the court. Um, and I mean, he gives Michigan that ability to, as we saw last season, if they want to go super small with him at the five, I mean, they can. Um, and then, yeah, just, just offensively, his ability to kind of, you know, he can, he's been doing a little bit of, he can maybe get a shot a little bit on his own. He can he can drive, kick out. He can um, knock down the threes, as we know. And I think that's just the biggest thing is just, uh, you know, Michigan had a, a couple guys that were shooting, you know, above 40% um, from three-point range. But, I mean, yeah, I think Isaiah just, on offense, he just opened up so much for so many, so many guys, and he just opened up the offense for them. And the big thing was spacing. I mean, you look back at that Purdue game, too, just when they kind of had, you know, Brandon Johns at the four, he just doesn't, he's just not as much of a three point threat and it's just kind of clogging things in the middle a little bit. And the offense just kind of was having trouble getting open looks just because they weren't able to get much spacing just because Brandon Johns just doesn't provide that same threat that Isaiah, Isaiah provides. And you look at when, you know, Michigan, when their offense was just like humming along, it was because, you know, Isaiah was there and they were just able to back down open shots and the, they were just able to spread the defenses out just because of the threat that he helped provide and just with, with him not there, and I think you just you're kind of seeing it more. I feel like on the offensive end, where there's been times where the Wolverines have have struggled to maybe space the floor here, especially in in Big Ten play. As, and as we know, when like you know, there's more scouting reports, and everyone knows everyone a lot more. I think that's just his absence. I think we're just seeing more on the offensive end these last few games with with their ability to kind of just kind of stretch out stretch out opponents and. Uh, Stretch the defenses. And we still really do not have an, a clear idea when he will be back, do we? No, I think the the problem with that was is that when he was announced, uh, we were told that he was going to be ruled out indefinitely, and that was late in December with a, with a groin injury. And we still don't we still don't even know the severity of the groin injury. Um, I mean, it could be a like a pull, a strain, it could be a tear. I mean, we don't know the severity of it. And I mean, groin injuries are a fickle. I mean, it's just one of those things where there's really nothing you can do to to kind of help the the healing process and help get, you know, recover from that quicker. It's just one of those things where you just have to let your body recover. And yeah, I think the like I said, I think the problem is that they announced he was out indefinitely, you know, the following week after that, that game against Presbyterian. And then the next week, Juwan Howard, you know, we would ask him for an update and then he said he's basically day to day and yeah. that was mm-hmm. going on two weeks ago and I think when most people hear day to day that signals he's close to a return so I think that's just kind of been the the I think the problem with this whole situation is just that I think like I said when people hear day-to-day you expect okay he's close to a return but um, as we know that's been almost going on two weeks ago and and just based on the sounds of it um, he really hasn't been able to do much in practice it sounds like he's only been able to kind of 
you know, run up and down and really do conditioning stuff. It doesn't sound like he's suiting up and actually taking part in drills during practice. And um, we have no idea, like, how far along he is in his rehab. No idea if he's, you know, cutting, jumping, doing any of those things. Because, um, like I said, groin injuries are fickle things. And, I mean, you don't want to do anything to kind of kind of suffer a setback because you don't know how, how long it's going to take to recover from that if you aggravate it. Um, so, yeah, that's the thing. We don't – it's just kind of there hasn't really been much clarity – um, we just keep hearing that he's getting better day by day. And as far as when he's, I mean, I think this week it's going to be close to four weeks that he's, since he's been injured. So, I mean, if it is a groin, if it is a groin strain, cause he was a, initially diagnosed with a, a muscle strain. Mm-hmm. Um, I think groin strains, like I said, it just depends on the person, but that could be like a I think If you look at WebMD, it's like a, you know, a six week injury. So we could still, he still could be sidelined the next two weeks. I mean, who knows? I think, like I said, the problem is just that we were never told the severity of the injury. Um, and the timeline with it, I think kind of, like I said, it just kind of just hasn't been much clear because going from indefinite to day to day in the course of a week, I think really kind of muddled things and really didn't provide a clear picture of, of I guess, how long they expected him to be out. Um, but just like I said, by the sounds of it, it, it doesn't sound like he's doing much at practice. And after the game against Minnesota, I asked, Coach Howard, if he was able to do any more in those two games leading up to that game, as opposed to before the Purdue game, and he said we'd had that we'd have to ask Isaiah, and we haven't got Isaiah, we haven't been able to speak to Isaiah since since he got injured, so that just hasn't really helped um, clear up anything. So, um, I I mean we'll we'll see. We won't get an update um, until Thursday before they they head to Iowa on Friday about if he's been able to do anything, but. Just based off what his teammates have said, it doesn't sound like he's been able to do much of anything um, in practice. So that just doesn't really seem like he's getting that much closer to a return. Well, I thought last week getting a split would be good, and we did. Uh, won at home, lost in the road. But now it's back on the road to uh, Iowa on Friday night, Carver Hawkeye Arena, which to me is a place Michigan never seems to play well. And you know, here we go. Another great post player, arguably the best in uh, the Big Ten, and uh, a team that really has a lot of weapons and offense, but luckily they don't have a good defense either, do they? No, I mean, we've already seen this kind of play out the, the first time when they, they kind of opened Big Ten play against each other. I think it was like, well, 101 to 94 or something like that. Yeah. It, was a, it was quite the shootout, and I think that's probably – we might see the same thing again. I mean, who knows, but – um yeah, it's just the weird. The weird thing of the Big Ten is, as we all know, it's so hard to win on the road. And I think most recently they they hosted Maryland and they just waxed Maryland. I think by twenty points or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's gonna it's it's gonna be a difficult difficult um, for Michigan to go in in there and win. Um, I mean, like like you pointed to it, it's been a difficult place for them to go in and win last season at all. I mean, you look at the last season. I remember. I think that was a game where everyone got in foul trouble. I think they had like half their starting lineup had three fouls or something like that. And that was a game that they lost um, by double digits and really never competed in that game. And so it's going to be, it's going to be quite the challenge. And I think like we were talking about earlier, it's going to be interesting to see what they try to do with, with Luca Garza. Um, I mean, especially on the road, if you let a guy like that kind of get onto a roll early, then you're going to kind of let the crowd get into it. And then, so it'll be interesting to see. It's going to like, as you, as you point out, it's going to be a, a tough test as we know, Every every game on the road in the Big Ten is going to be a huge challenge. I don't think there's any place you can point to. I don't even know if you can point to Northwestern and Nebraska as being easy places to win. Because as we've seen through, you know, the first few weeks of Big Ten play, only four teams have won on the road. That's, you know, Wisconsin's won a couple times, but they've also lost at home to, to Illinois. Um, Illinois won on the road. Michigan State's won on the road. Rutgers won on the road. So not a lot of teams have had success on the road. And I was kind of one of those, kind of one of those weird teams where, um, you kind of don't know what team you're going to get, but we saw that they can put up points in a hurry. They kind of, they hung, you know, 90 plus points on, on Michigan. And I think that's the most Michigan's allowed all season. And, you know, at home, they're going to be, they're going to be quite, quite the challenge just because they've been really, uh, like I said, they, they sumped Maryland on the road um, or they sumped Maryland at home already. So it's, it's going to be a tough, tough challenge. And like I said, it's going to be interesting to see what they try to do with Google Gars and try to maybe slow him down a little bit. Um, but yeah, that's a place where you really don't want to fall behind. Really, you don't want the crowd to kind of get into that. So yeah, I think it's going to be a, a tough test. And and you know, Michigan's going to have to they're going to have to make their three point shots. They're going to have to you know not turn the, not turn the ball over. They're going to have to kind of you know limit limit Iowa and the three point range, which they were able to do that first time. But um, 
Yeah, they're going to have to do a lot of things well. They're going to need some guys to step up on the road, which they kind of haven't had um, happen so far this season. So there's going to you're going to need a multitude of things to happen for them to kind of pull out a pull out a road win to kind of pick up their their first uh, true road win here this season. Well, last question for you, James. Uh, Michigan has, as we know, plenty of work to do on both sides of the ball, and and that's fine. It's uh, not even the middle of the Big Ten season yet, but in the last two weeks, have you seen anything that you know makes you think? This might not be an NCAA team by March. Yeah, it's just been tough just because I think the the parity in the Big Ten this season is has been incredible. I mean, any team is capable of beating anybody on any night. And so that's what maybe makes, you know, some of these – it just it just puts in the, puts in the focus that Michigan is just going to have a hard time winning on the road. And, I mean, you're going to have to defend home, and Michigan's going to have – they're going to have to host Michigan State, and they're going to have to host Ohio State. So they're going to have tough games at home that they're going to have to win. And I think I think the problem though is that just with given the start that Michigan had this season when they got off to a seven zero start, um, I think that really kind of raised the bar and raised you know the expectations for the team. But as we've seen, North Carolina has really just fallen off a cliff, and Iowa State lost to what was it Florida Florida A and M or yeah. some you know <laughs> some team that you know a low low tier team. Um, so I think that just them getting up to that start and winning that 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 for Atlantis tournament really raised the bar and expectations for this team. And I mean, yeah, I think they're going into this the season. I think the expectation was, you know, obviously to make the tournament. And I think they've you just kind of look at what they've done recently. And they've really struggled against you know, you know, top top teams. You just going back to you know, getting back to when they first started the Big Ten play. Yeah, I think there are concerns, obviously, with this team, and I think I think the biggest concern is just on defense. You look at, I mean, that was Michigan's bread and butter, their strength the last two years, and now, like like I was saying earlier, you look at the stats now, and they're like the worst in the Big Ten, giving up points. So, I mean, it is, I guess you could say it, it is too early. I mean, we are just a quarter of the way through Big Ten play, so we're just going to have to see how, how Juwan Howard adjusts things and maybe adjusts to the strength of this team, and, and it is it is just, it's going to be the longer Isaiah Livers is out, it's going to be tougher. But the one thing for me is just like moving forward. I think Michigan just needs some guys to step up. I mean, like I said, like we don't know how, how long Isaiah is going to be out. Um, the one thing for me is like Franz Wagner, he's had some good games the last two games, but the one person that's really got to step up is Eli Brooks. I mean, he's kind of just been almost non-existent on offense the last two games. I mean, he, he is a, he's a solid defender when I want, he does a lot of good things. Um, Defensively, I mean, against Purdue, he was the guy that was kind of chasing around uh, Sasha Stefanovic and really holding him to uh, a quiet game from outside. Um, but man, I, he's just kind of like I said. If you look at his stats against, you know, against kind of like these the cupcake teams, and then against like you know, kind of these the toughest competition, it's been a, a pretty crazy split. And I think he's been a guy that they really need to kind of show some life on offense um, to kind of help step up and. You know, fill the void with Isaiah out, but I think I think it is to really to uh, maybe press the panic button just because, like I said, I mean the Big Ten just been kind of a weird, it's been a weird season so far. I mean any, like I said, any team is capable of beating any, you know, anyone on any given night. But yeah, it's just the schedule they have. It's going to be tough for them to pull out wins on the wins on the road. I mean they face Northwestern and Nebraska, so those are two games maybe they're expecting to win. But I mean outside of that, I mean the, the game at Minnesota was a game they could have they had a chance to steal. But yeah, it's just going to be, it's going to be one of those years. I mean, like the, the, whoever wins the Big Ten, they might have five losses. I mean, maybe even more. I mean, last season I think Michigan had five losses and they didn't even. I mean, they fell a game short of winning a share of the title. So I think it's just, I think, like I said, I think it's just too early to maybe raise raise the alarm here and think that they're going to miss the tournament just because we haven't really seen Michigan make adjustments yet, like we've been talking about with on defense. So we'll see what. Juwan Howard and them do what they kind of do to tweak tweak things moving forward, but I think it's a it's it's a little bit too uh, too really to maybe uh, to be concerned about them making the uh, missing the NCAA tournament just because um, the Big Ten's been so good and I mean who I think some projections have what ten teams making the tournament so yeah, yeah. I mean as long as as long as Michigan's able to defend home most nights and as long as they're able to steal a couple of wins here on the road, I think that they'll still have a pretty good shot of, of making the postseason just because that that Creighton win is still kind of holding up and that and that Gonzaga win is probably going to hold up for a while um, on their resume. But, yeah, I just think it's it's too early 
to kind of raise concern. But I mean, there is there are concerns. Granted, yes, with this team, but as far as missing the postseason, I think there's still a long way to go before I guess we are we kind of reach that thing where we kind of start really wondering if this is a team that's even gonna be able to make it to the. Uh, NCAA tournament. No, I agree with that. And it's uh, been a wacky college basketball season so far. Crazy in the Big Ten. And we have more than half of the uh, the conference schedule to go. So, yeah, don't hit the eject button yet, Michigan fans. Uh, it could be interesting. So, we shall see. Our guest today has been uh, beat writer James Hawkins from the Detroit News. Always a pleasure to have you on the show, James. It's going to be, I think, a fun February and March. We all know that. And we look forward to uh, having you back on the next visit. All right, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Quick Hits is next as we wrap it up for another week here on The Michigan Man on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. On Quick Hits today, the challenge now for University of Michigan women's basketball head coach Kim barnes Rico and her team is to grow from a defeat that stung. Number 17 ranked Maryland, 12 and 4 overall, 3 and 2 in the Big Ten, put a 77-49 hurt on the number 24 Wolverines on Sunday at Chrysler Center. Michigan is now 11 and 5 overall, 2 and 3 in the Big Ten. Michigan had 14 of its 22 turnovers in the first half, shot poorly from the field, and never could get on track against a very physical Terrapin team. So, as Coach Rico said, they are more than capable. Now they have to get better from a disappointing loss. She said the champions are those who can push through. You've got to continue to persevere. You have to continue to fight. Every night is going to be a challenge, and that is so true. The ladies will be back in action on Thursday on the road in Madison against Wisconsin. Nick Blankenberg scored a goal and added an assist, and Strauss Mann made 25 saves as hockey defeated number 14-ranked Notre Dame 3-1 on Saturday night at Compton Family Arena in South Bend to complete a sweep of the Irish. The Wolverines earned a crucial six points over the weekend, and the sweep was their first on the road since January 2018, when a sweep at Minnesota propelled the 2017-18 squad on a run to the Frozen Four. Michigan heads to Happy Valley this weekend for a pair with Penn State. They are 9-11-2 overall, 4-7-1 in Big Ten play, heading into this weekend's action. Coach Carol Hutchins and softball had their first practice last week and are only weeks away from getting the season underway. They will open play in the Wilson D. Marini Tournament in Tampa on February 7th. Coach Eric Bakic in baseball will get practice underway in the next week and will be hard-pressed, of course, to repeat last year's incredible run to the College World Series, but they are expected to be very, very good this year and in the Big Ten race. Make sure you tell your family and friends about the show, like us, or comment about the program wherever you get your podcasts from, and thank you in advance. That will do it for another week. I'm your host, Mike Fitzpatrick. Have a great Wolverine week, everyone. Until next time, take care, and as always, go blue. Thanks for joining us today on The Michigan Man, here on Wolverine Sports Radio, a member of the V-Sporto Network, and in partnership with SB Nation's Maze and Brew. Our listener lines are open 24-7 for your calls, at 313-263-4842. That's 313-263-4842. Or email us at the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. That's the Michigan Man Podcast at yahoo.com. The Michigan Man Podcast is produced at the studios of Robin Lynn Productions, Allen Park, Michigan, and is not affiliated with the University of Michigan. Go Blue!